Committee. I'm Councilwoman Sandoval. I represent District 7 on City Council, and I can't tell you how excited I am to be here today and that all of you are here today. Congratulations on getting to this point, guys. Um, so if you recall, a few months ago, we met at the Central Library. It was your first group was a lot more scrunched up. We weren't at tables. I don't think too many people knew each other quite yet. So we've come, you have come a long way uh, since then. We've gotten some new faces uh, since the beginning. Um, I'm really here just to listen to your reactions to the plan and to, to watch what happens afterward. Uh, my job will be to carry it forward and help get the votes that we need at council and to do some of the outreach uh, that we will probably need to do in many of the sectors. And I expect you to join me in doing that as well. So we'll talk about that near the end. But enjoy your meeting. I'll be here listening. Thank you. All right. Well, um, can everybody hear me now? At the beginning, loud. Louder. <laughs> um, so thank you all for, for being here. Um, I think it's a very exciting afternoon. We have... Um, a great agenda for you this this afternoon. I think what we're going to be doing is really kind of walking you through um, the Paris Complaint Plan, kind of giving you an orientation over the plan, um, talk about our next steps, and kind of what happens from here. Um, as our councilwoman said earlier, it was um, June 22nd, uh, 2017, was a historic date for San Antonio when our mayor and city council um, made this commitment. And over the past almost a year now I've been it's been such an honor to serve this community and to work with so many people um, that have volunteered to help with this plan and uh, I want to thank you all I've, I've learned so much from so many of you and so many people have put in a, 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 a lot of hours of hard work and so um, I think we should congratulate ourselves on the teamwork because it has really taken everyone in this room all of our consultants, our city staff, working together to produce the, this plan. Um, we are going to be submitting uh, this plan to the public this Friday, uh, February the 25th. You're already calling about it now. <laughs> um, get ready. Um, and in, uh, really over the next 30 days is the, uh, the public commenting period. And that will be ending on February the, or, uh, yeah, February 25th. I think what's really important is to, um, and we, we've talked about this, many of us, throughout this process. We are not only volunteers working on, the, on this plan, but we're also ambassadors of the plan, right? To really educate and reach out to the people of San Antonio and talk to them about the elements of the plan, how our weather will be changing, what climate change is, and how it will affect them. And I think most importantly, how our city is going to get prepared to do something about it. Um, and that, with the, that's what this plan is really about. Um, I think with that, I'll kind of turn it over to, uh, to Femi and say a few things. Um, yes. Thank you very much for being here. Uh, it's been a long journey, uh, but we're really proud to say that we have gotten to this point. Uh, for those of you I've spoken to, I've always said congratulations to all of us, because this is really, it really has been a collective effort, and uh, I appreciate the support that we all received uh, during the good times and the bad times. I mean, this is all part of, you know, making this what you see here as a draft plan, and um, I would not spend too much time because Anita, Anita has said just about everything I wanted to say, but I want to introduce uh, Danielle Vita. She has been the, really on the, on the consultant side, the, the face, uh, the person we saw every month and uh, had various opportunities to interact with her and also provide really what climate change and climate mitigation, climate change mitigation and adaptation means for San Antonio. That, that perspective of what it is for San Antonio was something that we were able to, I think, through our various meetings, um, bring into this document you see before before us today. And um, I would just say thanks, and I look forward to hearing your overview of, uh, of this uh, plan. Danielle? Great, and I think actually we have um, one tape statement we're gonna go into before I just dive into the details of the meeting. <laughs> Thank you. 
Good afternoon, everyone. I'm sorry I can't be with you today because of another obligation, but I wanted to make sure to thank you all for your very hard work. It's been tough work, but when we started this effort on the very first day of the new council, and I signed our commitment as a community onto the Paris Climate Court and the Mayor's Climate Action Agenda, we wanted to make sure that we did this the right way, which included the entire community. And your efforts over the last year have been why we are at this point. Thank you so much for all the work that has led to not only a Bloomberg Award and recognition, but also a recognition from around this community with the agencies and the partners that you'll continue to work with, from SAWS to CPS, to the San Antonio River Authority, and even VIA, and of course, the city of San Antonio. Our entire community is behind you. Uh, we look forward to the work ahead. You have my commitment as a mayor to make sure that we are championing your efforts and that we get to full implementation on a brighter, more resilient future for San Antonio. Thank you so much. Okay, great. Well, I'm just going to set the uh, kind of rules for the meeting, what to expect. Um, we are running this a little bit differently than we would a steering committee and technical working group meeting, partially because there's 80, 90 people in the room and want to make sure that we can um, we can have everyone heard. Um, that said, uh, we are following a few of those rules. We are asking that if you haven't already, please do sign in before you leave the room so that we know who was here and present at the meeting. In addition, um, we will be opening a full public comment period at the end. So as usual, um, we are following kind of those rules, two minutes per speaker, and um, we'll be, would like you to sign in. There is a sign-in sheet for public comments at the, um, at the back. We can try to circulate that around, and um, we have about half an hour of prepared material. What we are trying to do here is orient you to the plan. We know that you just got it in your inbox this morning, um, and we understand that not everyone has had the chance to look at it. To tell you the truth, we have been, um, we were literally working up to yesterday evening with meetings with the mayor, council, um, to get final details in this um, and make sure that we had all of those pieces um, addressed. That said, we also have seen that there are little details that, you know, little um, uh, letter <laughs> missed somewhere or things like that, and we absolutely are working to um, clean those up and make sure that those are addressed in this process. Um, as we go through this, you have seen kind of what we would call a sneak peek of the document. It is, it's public, but it's not officially public at this point. It will be posted to the website as of Friday morning, um, and that's when the official comment period opens. There is also the team here I know has been engaging with um, council members' offices, briefing them on the plan as it goes public, making sure that agencies, all the agencies with, and departments within the city government are aware that this plan is going public. Um, there's been discussions. I know there are news articles coming out, blog articles, so that there will be a full public release Friday morning. Um, at this point, um, the only difference that you might see between now and Friday is if we pick up any of those little, like, a misspelling or typo that was missed, and there's a chance that the front cover picture might change. But none, you may see a different front cover picture, but none of the content will change. This is what is going to the public. So I just want to make sure that we're clear on what we're going to see. As of that, I think that's all I really need to say at this moment. I'm going to turn it over to Doug to talk a little bit um, about where we are. I'm going to come back and do an orientation of the plan, and again, we'll open it up for that public comment and question. And really, at this point, we know that not everyone has had the chance to dig in. We'd really like to make sure that we are clarifying things for anyone. If anyone doesn't, you know, wants to understand where things are in the plan, how to find more information, what else is connected, all of those pieces, we want to make sure you understand the process and know how to um, engage through the next couple of months. And, and I think what, I think the importance of that is back to this dialogue that we have with the community, right, in terms of engaging, you know, we want you to go back, all of us engage with our networks so that we understand the plan so that we can communicate it to others so that we can, we can hear their concerns or their recommendations or, or, you know, their feedback. So again, I think the goal here is let's understand it so that we can be, um, um, engaging with our networks. Okay, thank you, uh, thank you all. Um, I'm waiting, I don't even know what the next slide is, so I'm just gonna, <laughs> but just a little context, 
you know, to, to reiterate what, uh, what the councilwoman said and, and the others, you know, thank you. This, this hasn't been easy. Um, I've been doing this for 16 years now, dozens of planning initiatives. Um, never had we had this much time with steering committee technical working groups that we've dedicated um, with you all. You know, three hour meetings on a monthly basis. I commend you for making that commitment and, and um, sticking with it. I mean, that's truly a, a impressive and it was a lot to ask. So um, I, I very much want to thank you. I also want to go back to um, a statement I might have made at the beginning and maybe a couple times throughout uh, about what the, the goal of this was and what does success look like. And I might have asked some of you throughout the process you know, what, what does success look actions. Um, those longer term actions, a lot of them are already sort of in process already. We'll, it's not that we're just kicking those down the road and we'll never touch them. I think we still want to keep our eye on them, but what do we need to do over the next few years? And as we were developing this plan, one of the things that was at the back of my mind was how are we going to implement this? What resources do we have to move this forward? And um, some of you, I had periodically, periodically had emails over the past few months sending us Bloomberg. You guys should go up to Bloomberg. And the thing about Bloomberg, and we, we, were, we were very tight lipped because we had to correct instructions from Bloomberg not to talk about it. And so it was a really rigorous um, process, really competitive. Um, I tried not getting my hopes up, um, but you know, Eloisa was always very optimistic. But um, this is huge. So, so thank you. Um, you know, when we had met with Bloomberg, it was touting everything that we're doing. It was touting the process that we have with you all. And it was the timing that we are ready to you know, get this plan done and start implementing it. So if you go to the next slide, this is what Bloomberg's trying to do. It's all about you know, reducing emissions from um, and it's all data driven. Uh, we've been working with them on very specific greenhouse gas reduction targets. Um, there's going to be a lot of accountability uh, re reporting to them. But the goal is, um, how do we reduce emissions in the building sector and the transportation sector? Um, and that basically aligns with our emissions structure. It's buildings and transportation. Go to the next slide. These are the cities that originally started at as 20. Um, and then I remember they, it was brutal how they did it. They released you know four here, three here, five here. Um, and at some point, we hit like 20. And it's like, well, wait a minute. You know, well, at one point, we were announced there was like two left. Two spaces left. It was me. It was it was uh, Austin. It was um, San Antonio. And then I started hearing, well, Denver's got it, or you know, this city's got it. I said, well, wait a minute. I was doing my math on my fingers. What's more than 20? They expanded it to 25 because there were so many um, uh, really good um, <coughs> applications in there. So next slide. This is basically what we're going to be working with them on. Um, we're, it, so on the building side. Um, Starting to figure out, well, you know, what does building disclosure look like uh, in, in San Antonio? Uh, EV and solar ready, PACE, um, zero net energy policy and deep retrofits for municipal buildings, um, and then 100% renewable um, for city operations on the transit, transportation side, public transit, Connect SA, uh, TDM programs, and citywide EV charging. Um, that corresponds pretty well with a lot of the, the things that we're trying to accomplish. In, in the um, in the plan. Let's go to the next slide. The big question is, what do we get? Um, we don't get any money. Uh, that's always been the, the big question. Um, it's, right it's, there's no there's no money. Um, it's um, but that being said, uh, it's 2.5 up to 2.5 million dollars worth of support, and um, some of that support is coming in the form of two um, contract positions that will be in my office. One will focus on the building side, and one that will be working on the transportation side. Uh, policy development, um, working with stakeholders, working with internal stakeholders, how do we start moving these things forward? Um, the other thing that comes with it, it's a really complicated structure. Um, there's lots of people, um, but there is you know, a city strategist, we have an implementation coach in Austin who's gonna help us move this forward. But the real big thing is the, the ACC partners. Um, those are the, the, the national um, experts who are going to be available to actually work with us on a daily basis and, and, and different stakeholders in the community to start crafting um, 
crafting these programs and policies, whether it's the Rocky Mountain Institute or, or NACTO um, or the Institute for Market Transformation. These are folks who have been working in, uh, in this for years, and they'll be there with us um, uh, moving forward. In terms of process, positions are posted. Uh, if you know anybody, push them, uh, push them out. Um, you think about it, there's 25 cities nationally. Everybody's looking for staff. How many qualified people are there you know, in, in, in this field? So the more, we, more um, uh, interest we can get, the better. Um, we're working on a, uh, the MOU um, between our attorneys and NRDC's attorneys, which is always fun. Um, that's sort of getting um, all of the, um, the expectations outlined. And we are um, currently working with um, the Bloomberg team on what they're calling sort of like the delivery plan. For all those um, strategies that were outlined before, how are we actually going to start moving the needle on those and who needs to be at the table, what resources can they provide? So, you know, it's a great opportunity. Um, I think, you know, with this plan and its successful adoption, then I think we, you know, we hit the throttle and, and, and basically just don't, don't look back. Um, and so I think we're open um, to hear thoughts, hear comments, um, again, and I can't say it enough, the draft. Uh, it's not easy. This isn't easy work, um, but I think we're we're get, we're getting there. I think there's some more that we need to do. But I think we're we're in a good position. The other thing, and I know uh, Danielle will go into the plan a little more. I mean, it, it's there's some big statements. There's some big commitments around around equity. There's a lot of good stuff in this plan. We also crammed a lot into it when you when you start looking at it in detail. Um, you know, I think I feel good about what what's there. But uh, again, I think we need to keep the conversation going and bring everybody as, as close as possible by the time this gets to, gets to council where everybody can come around and, and support it. I think that's it. Yeah. Awesome. Well, that's really exciting. We've been uh, loving hearing kind of what's going on with San Antonio and all the um, all the implementation that's kicking off as we release this uh, draft into the community. Um, I think I think almost everyone in this room knows me, but I think there's a few of you on the steering committee who have not had the chance to meet you because my colleague has been here for the steering committee meeting. So, um, Danielle Goodoff, if you haven't met me, um, I've been leading pretty much every one of the technical working group meetings since about June. So, um, and. This, uh, this plan, I'm, I'm really excited to share this with you and hear comments because I have had this open on my computer since the technical working group meeting in December. So I am really excited to hear what, what the reactions are and um, make sure that we're incorporating you know, the voices of the community in here. Um, all I'm here to do is just give you an orientation of the plan and make sure that you guys understand what's in here. I know you haven't had the chance to read it. That's okay. That's why there's a 30-day public comment period. That is the opportunity for everyone to really digest what's in this plan, to go talk to your communities, talk to coworkers, talk to your neighbors, talk to the people that you're involved with, and make sure that all the voices from this community are being involved as we move forward with this process. Um, so again, you know, the plan contents, I would say, you know, we could, we're going to talk through some of the big chunks here, but um, this, if you look at other plans that are out there, um, you know, from different cities, they will follow a very, um, very similar sort of organization. Um, you will notice that the plan does start off with some big statements about the history of San Antonio, how we got here, um, who you know San Antonio is as a city, um, and what what the reason is that we are building out this plan now, right? And I think that that's something that has been embedded in the, the discussions that a lot of you guys are in. A lot of you guys are in the position that you understand why this plan is being built now. But I think that's still a learning process for a lot of our community, and I think it's really important to um, not gloss over some of that language that um, allows people to really understand the story of why we're here and where we've, um, where we've come from. The big kind of chunk of material starts with the climate equity section. Um, and this, I think we've talked about this, this was a very deliberate um, action uh, directed by the city to put the climate equity section at the front. Um, the definition sits on that first page. 
There's examples of what um, inequities look like in the city of San Antonio. And then the climate equity screening mechanism, that tool that's kind of been developed and still will go through piloting and work, is in the appendix of the plan. This is something that will set San Antonio's plan apart from other cities. There, as we talked about this, there are a lot of climate equity. Um, there's climate equity work being done. Um, there are climate equity um, documents out by other cities. Most of them have been done after the planning process, right? They built climate equity on top of something they'd already done. It was a separate track, a separate process. Putting climate equity at the front of this plan will be a very big statement um, by the San Antonio plan. Um, so yes, you know, that kind of covers all of the work that the climate equity team technical working group was working on, the definition um, that everyone saw in December, as well as um, setting some of that reason for why this is important to San Antonio um, and really giving some of that data to support um, what, what equity and inequities look like in San Antonio. The next section um, really covers the greenhouse gas inventory it's, um, and the climate projections. It talks about the challenge and the response, right? Where is San Antonio now? What do our emissions look like? What have they looked like historically? What do the municipal emissions look like? And what do the climate projections tell us is going to happen? This sets the baseline. Again, we've talked about this, right? The baseline, the greenhouse gas emissions are the starting point for the mitigation measures. The climate projections and understanding where our climate goes is the baseline for the adaptation measures. Um, so really sets that um, story. And then one of the things the city really wanted to include in the plan um, is there are two spreads in here that talk about, <coughs> well, what does this mean for both vulnerable populations in the community, trying to link this to people, especially those that are most vulnerable, and what does it mean for businesses in the community? And we talk about some of those disruptions and opportunities for the business sector's ways um, and other ways that businesses are getting involved um, to help reach out to some of the different constituents and groups that will be that will be looking at this plan and, and wanting to provide input one way or another. From there, we move on. Let me jump to the next slide, to the mitigation section. Um, this is really the heart of a lot of the work that you've seen, right? We set the stage for um, what is mitigation, what is Paris compliance, why, what does that extra one and a half degree mean? Why is this a one and a half degree plan, not a two degree plan? And then the big chunk of it is the mitigation strategies, right? The mitigation strategies have changed slightly since you saw them in December. This is all through engagement. Um, offices, um, departments, uh, community groups providing comments. And I believe Chris sent uh, an email just as everyone was walking in the room here with, there's an Excel document we have not printed out because it tracks changes through a course of events, but you can see how those mitigation measures have changed all the way from the end of October through the December meeting through any changes, comments, and changes came in and changes into this plan. You will notice that the overall strategies themselves, very few changes. There are some additions and adjustments on the implementation side, um, but the strategies themselves are very much um, the same. The, um, that has been a big process by the city to build in that, um, build in all those comments, and that's an expectation going forward that they will continue to receive comments through this process, and that'll be part of the final decisions. Jump to the next one. Um, the next chapter digs into the adaptation piece, really presents um, the risks that were identified for the city, um, why adaptation is important, some scenarios of kind of the cost of doing nothing. Um, the cost of doing nothing is really hard to quantify on a whole, um, even at a worldwide level. Um, but through some of this work, we're able to pull out some of those things of what increased temperatures, increased um, ozone, um, increased wildfires could look like for the city to start to set that plan. And then um, we include the full list of adaptation strategies, which again, um, are very similar to what you saw in December, um, but again, have had some adjustments based on a lot of final input um, from departments and such in um, this process. 
Um, do I have another slide? Yes, I have one more. The final <laughs> chapter, um, before we move into all the appendices that are included here, is the implementation. And I know this is something we spent a decent amount of time talking about in December, and I think something that's critically important from the city's perspective is setting a boundary around the process. What might this look like as this is enacted as a plan, as it comes into uh, policy, and how would it move forward, and how would the city engage in the process? Um, it, is, it is at the higher level, but it sets very specific recommendations um, for what that process looks like, how often things are updated, and how the um, sustainability office will continue to report progress on the plan. And then we move into the appendix. And there's a pretty heavy duty appendix in this document, um, full kind of methodology as well as the equity screening mechanism, all of the implementation um, strategies that were included, um, and you know, all of that's right in the plan itself. One of the directives from the city was that this plan be digestible in that. It's not a 200-page document. There are a large number of other appendices that will be available alongside the document, including the greenhouse gas inventory, the climate projections, um, the vulnerability and risk assessment, um, you know, all of those different pieces that you've seen throughout the planning process. Um, and I do believe the vulnerability and risk assessment is was going through final edits and is should be up live when this plan goes out as well. Yep, which will... Um, be another, another fun read if you want to dig into that. Um, so all of those sit alongside the plan. Everything will be live on Friday morning, and that is when the comment period officially opens. Um, in terms of comments, I'm going to let Eloisa talk more about kind of the strategies here. OK. <laughs> um, but Chris, who's here, um, and you've received emails from in these last couple of months, is going to be the main, sounds like the main collector of those comments. So you are welcome um, to communicate with Chris directly, to communicate with anyone, but everything will be going into his hands to collect and collate and make sure that all of those voices from the community are heard. Eloisa? Would you like to talk about where we go next? Yes. So I think you guys have seen this before that where we're at in the process. Um, at, we've kind of changed some of this language even in our fact sheet so people understand where we're at and what we're asking for comments. But I really wanted to talk to you about what does engagement look like from now until adoption. Um, and I kind of wanted to talk to you about the little different pieces that we have working, uh, going on, and then I uh, would like to talk to you a little bit about how you can help us with that. Um, we have three major objectives. We really want to build awareness about the process and the plan, um, and we want to get feedback on the draft, and we want to encourage action. So we've done, we've got a couple of things. We have a, a small contract that will, um, with a local organization that's going to help us uh, get PR and stories out into the community. Um, and, and really help us with social media support uh, through adoption. We also uh, wanted to continue um, the Climate Equity Fellowship work that we had started last summer, um, and we were able to uh, have uh, dedicate some funding to actually hiring two additional people that we have currently working temporarily for um, uh, from now actually through uh, adoption. And what they're going to be doing is that they're focusing um, on canvassing city facilities, like public libraries. In fact, they will be out. Um, they will be out, and Chris will be out the day that this plan goes out to one of the libraries. So I think we have 34 spots scheduled, um, and and so they will be uh, kind of on the ground and really talking to people face to face as well um, with staff. And then city staff ourselves, we are diving in deep, every city will go staff member will be um, going to neighborhood association meetings, HOA meetings, uh, community events, uh, schools. Um, we have a few different things that we're working on, um, both in the college level um, and also in high school level. So we have quite a, and actually we're developing some work 
um, and some activities for even K through 12 groups. So we have quite a bit going on. And then in addition to that, we're working on uh, how do we help get the word out. So we want to put some hard copies in all the districts and libraries so that people can actually touch it, feel it, and get it for themselves. Um, we plan on putting together some email blasts that will be going out uh, pretty consistently over the next few weeks, but up until adoption. We really um, will be sending those to you all as well, and we hope that you will send those to other individuals and make sure we're able to spread the word. Um, and then we're also going to be reaching out through, I don't know if you guys have signed up for the city's post of text, but there's a lot of people that have signed up for that, so we're also going to be texting it out to individuals. Um, so that they are aware. We'll be reaching out through the City Council newsletters. We'll have it on our website, of course, and um, uh, I, the uh, TVSA um, channel will also be running some, some advertisements regarding that the plan is out. And so those are kind of some of the main pieces, and I... Did you want to mention the appendix that you'll eventually have? Yes. So that's a great thing. I wasn't sure where we were going to mention that, but one of the things, one of the appendixes that we're also going to um, include uh, will be kind of a summary of all the engagement that has been done up to date. Um, so not up to date, throughout this entire process. So we'll be able to uh, have a bit clearer understanding of, of who we've engaged and, and what we've heard, um, and it'll help tell the, the, the story of, of this planning effort in, in general. So you should be seeing that as well. Councilwoman, did you want to say a few words? This is yeah. the time. <laughs> um, thank you, Elisa. So yesterday I met with the team uh, about the proposed plan. And the truth is we didn't delve too much into the details about the text. What we were worried about was our strategy to make sure that ultimately we got something adopted that everyone's OK with, but the adoption is, is our big deal. So what, what we'd like to ask of you uh, are, are a few things. You've already given us a lot of your time and all of your input. And you'll see it reflected in the plan, but we're not there yet, so we have a few asks of you. Uh, in terms of making sure that the plan gets the due attention and the supported needs in the community, we'd like to ask you to go back to your organizations and schedule a presentation of the plan. Uh, doesn't have to be, you know, a three-hour presentation, but a brief overview of the plan to either a professional group that you're part of or the company uh, where you work or a group that you uh, that you assemble with regularly. So in the case of uh, Ms. Lisa Martinez, uh, the master naturalist, right? How often do they get together? Uh, typically once a month. Okay, so would that be something that's doable? Oh yeah, I, in fact, uh, I gave a presentation in June and I've always told So if you could help us coordinate the scheduling and someone from the team will make the, the presentation. What are some of the other organizations that that are represented here that you think this could work out? This is in the Engineering 30 district. Wonderful. Alta Vista Neighborhood Association. Great. <laughs> U.S. Green Building Council. Oh, I bet they're a great candidate uh, for it. Anyone else? March for Science. March for Science. Of course. <laughs> Perfect. Sierra Club. AIA. Okay. Sierra Club. Sierra Club. Santa Club. Oh, that's a great one. That's like, what did you guys just say? Santa Club. Santa San Antonio Mobility Coalition. Oh, that's wonderful. Um, I'm sure there's many more out there. You could recommend that everyone, at least, uh, everyone do at least one. If you can think of two, that would be fantastic. Um, even if it's your neighborhood association, maybe it's your church. Um, so that that was really going to be our our ask. Have I have I covered it? That's a great ask. Yes. And I, and I want to I want to just clarify. This is staff did not come up with this. If you come up with brilliant things, but uh, this is really an ask from the mayor's staff and my staff. It's going to make our job a whole lot easier on council if this work gets out there in a grassroots way. Thank you. Thank you. Coordinate it through the office of Santa Clara. Absolutely. Well, and make sure, I mean, even even if you're going to present yourself, even if you don't need a staff member present, I mean, they're more than happy to help support. 
let's make sure we're tracking those events in the process so we understand. So when this goes to council, they understand everyone that has participated in this process because that's going to make it easier for them to understand where the community is and whether you're collecting feedback that's in support of the plan, you know, wants the plan to go further, is worried about how aggressive it is. We want all of that feedback in the plan as it goes to council. Um, we also want to talk about next steps. Where do we go from here? Um, what we have here is kind of the detailed schedule. We, we have that, we will have the public release this Friday. Um, so you should be seeing this up on the, um, on the website and you should be seeing the press release go out and you should also be seeing emails uh, that you all can share with your list and your friends and colleagues. Um, we will be starting the um, Adoption process by uh, going to the Planning Commission first. We have those states listed there. Um, once we uh, go to the pub, we have the public comment period and we go to the, pub the Planning Commission, we will be having another special steering committee uh, with all everyone else involved and invited as well um, to talk about kind of what we heard and kind of what we're going to ultimately move forward with, right? So, what we hear from the community and the feedback. And and the planning commission, and then ultimately uh, do that final leg of the adoption process, which would be to go to um, uh, community health and equity, the, the council committee that uh, Councilwoman Sandoval leads, and then we'd be going to uh, B session, and then ultimately A session uh, in April. Um, I also want to reiterate, although we have a kind of an official 30-day public comment period, public comments are accepted really up until we adopt the plan. So, uh, you know, we provide some structure just so that we're able to kind of capture and move forward, but um, public comments really continue until the, to the end to the adoption. Okay, other than that, is that, is that, I think we're on to our next spot. Yeah. Awesome, great. We're just uh, chatting over here because realizing that at the beginning of the meeting, I. Um, I said there's a sign-in for public comment, and I'm not sure there actually is. So um, there is. Is there? Because I haven't found it, and no one else knows about it. But that's okay. Um, <laughs> it's been hidden somewhere. That's okay. We will keep track of everyone um, that weighs in. So what we're doing? That is the end of our prepared content. We didn't. Want, I mean, we wanted to really have this meeting um, be about you, but make sure that you know about the process. We are here to start collecting comments. If there are any answering questions, we will do that in a formal setting here as a group for anything we'd like to bring up. And then we'll kind of um, close out that and we will circulate around for anyone else who wants to provide comments in a little less formal way. Um, so given that I don't know where the sign-in sheet is, I am going to do this by raise of hands, <laughs> which is going to be fun. Um, <laughs> Lisa is ready to have go. a little guidance to this. Yes. So when you, when you stand up to speak, if you please would state your name and what working group or steering committee that you are on, because not everybody here knows each other, so we'd love to, to do that for Thank you. And there is a time, sorry, Lisa, there is a time limit because I know people are asking and I know I mentioned this in the beginning. We're going to try to keep these to two minutes. This is partially just to respect everyone's time and the fact that we have so many people in the room. If there are longer comments, we are more than happy to collect those, talk a little bit more in the informal setting, but we want to make sure we'll be respectful of time here. Okay, I'll, I'll cover two points. One is kind of a toss out. In the course of my working on this project, I have made ample use of our San Antonio Public Library. There are a lot of resources, a lot of books that I have read cover to cover to understand carbon storage, carbon sequestration, soil health, and all the other topics. So I'd like to suggest that one of the things we can available for the public is a list and if anybody knows a librarian I can work with or I can just reproduce it myself and I'm sure there are others I never ran across. The, the second one is kind of going full circle back to our first meeting. We were motivated by concerns that the municipal bond rating of the city might be affected if our climate action plan wasn't up and up. But in the process of doing this we haven't actually talked about that. And when we get to the plan, there's only one place where I see finance addressed at all. And so I just want to put on the table that I think that one of the things we should solicit, whether the results are to our liking or not, is examples and views, uh, but mostly examples, 
of what people actually think these things might cost. Not that we necessarily need to pay for it out of our tax dollars, because other communities have formed different philanthropic arrangements. And we, for example, have just benefited from Bloomberg's uh, philanthropic, philanthropic um, interest. But I do think that we, we had a, a, a core issue raised about our city's financial bond rating, and we haven't talked about it at all since. So if there is anything to say between now and the time this goes to city council, someone has to say it. So all I would say, I'm going to try to keep any comments really short, but what I would like to say about that is that urge you to read the vulnerability and risk assessment when it comes up because there was quite a bit of digging for the costs of climate change. There are a few notes in that plan. There's a section in the adaptation section on the cost of doing nothing um, where the team actually dug in, went to departments, asked for examples of what different climate change events could cost. There is, that data is hard to come by. Um, and it's a real challenge for a lot of people to dig that up. So if you do have, if you do come across examples, I absolutely um, would appreciate those coming to the table because it is not easy data to come by. Yes. Absolutely. Other? Hi, Sandra Montalvo uh, here on the Energy and Building Technical Working Group uh, on behalf of AIA San Antonio. Just out of curiosity, when you mentioned that you'll be taking feedback, is that going to be um, captured in any way in, in, a, in a survey form or how exactly and then how will that actually affect this draft version so the whole point of releasing a draft is that it's still malleable so how would that will those be um, integrated yes. so we're going to be taking feedback in multiple ways uh, we will have an online survey uh, but it will also have open comments so that people can freely provide their thoughts. Um, we will also be taking feedback in person. We'll be taking feedback via email. Uh, we will even be willing to take feedback uh, by phone. So um, we'll have a, quite a few ways to be able to provide feedback. That's the first part of your question. The second part of your question is all the feedback that we've received today, that actually is going to be available online. And so that will be publicly available. And then the third part to your question is what are we going to do with that information? So we will actually acknowledge the public comments as they're coming through, and um, you know whether it's a, we acknowledge it and nothing is necessarily changed, or if there was something that we changed, we acknowledge the fact that we made the change. So anything just like you have received, we mentioned that you have a document right now talking about what changes have been made up to this point, that's exactly what would happen as well. That would be added to that record. And that is part of the purpose of that uh, steering committee meeting with all the technical working groups invited is to summarize some of that comment that's coming, especially where it's multiple voices added together in similar topics to make final decisions on any adjustments to the plan before moving to the city council process. Is that good at all? Russell? No, thank y'all for a beautiful document, but it, I do have a, it just now glancing through it and two things uh, come to my mind. First thing on page uh, 37, we, and I'm Russell Seal from the uh, Energy and Building Committee of Sierra Club members. And we've spent a whole lot of time talking, especially advocated by Steve from CI, about interim goals. And, uh, what are, and to have a Paris compliant uh, climate action plan, we have to have reductions soon. We have to have most of the reductions happen soon. And here we have, uh, you have a sentence on here, but then a 2030, 2040, and a 2050. Not having a sooner interim goal with targets on there, I see it's a, a, will be to be determined still. Well, we've been talking about it for a year. <laughs> it's, I hate to go into the draft to final without having a process for determining a 2020 to 2025, the very short-term goals. And then the other piece, I, I may be missing it, I come to it, I don't see a conclusion page, the final conclusion, what can I do? What can I, what can I do for myself, my family, what uh, actions should we, I be taking as decisions as an individual? And I don't see that wrapped up in a conclusion. Okay, thank you, Russell. Anything, Doug, you wanna to respond to? Or? 
Well, in terms of the last, I mean, the last comment, I think, I mean, that's a great point. I think being able to integrate that, the what can folks do is important. I think in terms of the interim targets, we had lots of discussions about how to handle that and what decisions that we could, we could make based upon what we knew at this point. And it sort of gets to the bigger discussion that we've been having since we started around decarbonizing the energy grid and what do we know now that we can basically make decisions about. So I think if, what I would say is this plan, as we go forward, as we implement what we know will change. You know, I, I think what I said from the beginning is this is our first climate plan. This is setting the, the, the foundation for us moving forward and um, making sure that the decisions that we're making are based upon the factual knowledge that, that we know. So I think as we go forward, moving forward with implementation, I think, and as I think we see the field evolve, what you see on paper will, will change. But I think the goal is what do we have now that what do we know that we can start implementing? And we will have more, more conversations around what's on, on the, the page um, and, and what that pathway is, but I don't want to take up too much time. I guess the one thing too, and, and this is separate, I think, from your comment, Russell, but I just want to make sure everyone in the room is very aware that in terms of interim goals and starts of decarbonization, the Dealey Coal Plant will shut down in December, right? Which yeah. is going to make a difference for the <laughs> And I think all of you are aware, but just make sure that that comes to the table. Other comments? Meredith? Please remember to state your name and what committee. Okay. Hi, I'm Meredith McGuire, and I'm on the Water and Natural Resources Committee. Uh, I have two. One of them is a short uh, question, and the other is a little bit longer. Uh, uh, the first one has to do with the greenhouse gas uh, uh, inventory and the uh, goals around that. And I'm in the process of planning a program for Trinity University, and one of the things that they would like to know about, I'm sure, has to do with the uh, scope two and three uh, emissions. And we were told early on in this process that the initial thing is not going to be about the larger scope, but the fact of the matter is if our re energy utility is producing X amount of emissions, even though they aren't being used right within the city, it seems to me that one of the things that we need to be paying attention to is how do we get rid of those emissions totally, not just sort of like when we get around to coming up with a county plan or what have you. So that's one thing I would like to know how we can put that information in here without it being sort of blown off. And at the same time, I realize that, that you're trying to keep the scope of what you're trying to do right away focused. I, I would like to see something added that really deals with the recognition of the fact that there's a lot of industry outside of the borders of San Antonio, which is producing a lot of greenhouse gas emissions. And if we really want to get, protect this city, from, uh, the whole earth from that tipping point, we have to address those. My second question, which is really probably more important for our, our shorter term uh, planning, has to do with how do we address the kinds of regulations that we need to have happening right away uh, in terms of the long-term goals. And I just got finished reading some of the, what should we say, the uh, regrets that people who were working on the issue in Phoenix, which started a lot earlier than San Antonio did, but they haven't achieved as much as they needed to achieve, partly because they didn't turn things into regulations for new buildings. <coughs> And so uh, what I'd like to have us do is also have some way of getting a sense of how can we get those regulations in place as quickly as possible that maximize the uh, potential for us to achieve in 10 years some noticeable uh, improvements. Okay. Um, so in terms of the first question, um, scope three is identified in the in the plan as a strategy, um, a, a near term strategy to undertake a, a, a scope three inventory that will capture, you know, all those things that are being um, sort of induced by all of us, um, but are occurring outside our borders. 
um, in terms of you know, why the inventory is just using sort of what we're responsible responsible for. Again, it's it's that methodology that we're using that it, it's basically what can what can city council and the community control. So that's sort of why that um, hash out that way in the appendix um, in the green and there's a, there's a summary that clearly identifies here's all of CPS's generation and it shows which part is is um, sort of excluded from this plan so it's definitely at least you know, bookmarking that there's more emissions that aren't being captured by this plan and then thirdly I would say that you know in the strategy around decarbonization and, and we've mentioned this before there's a lot more conversation that needs to happen around energy planning that we could accomplish in in this time period and so you know in, including the strategy around having more robust transparent energy planning conversations between the city CPS and the community is, is essential if we're going to to get to where we need to go so I think it, it doesn't it doesn't answer all the questions but I think it sets that that framework for what we need to work off of on the second part um, as far as regulations I think as I mentioned earlier unless a plans implemented it's not going to be doing what it needs to be uh, to be doing it's not going to accomplish what it needs to accomplish I would say as we start having those conversations with council and the community about implementing this all those details about how we do it are going to start being hashed out so I think um, I think we were hesitant to start putting a lot of heavy-handed things in right from the start um, with the understanding that we're going to need more conversations across stakeholders to figure out what what does this look like for San Antonio some might be the might be incentives some might be more regulation but I think we need to have those those conversations before we say this is definitely what we're gonna going to do but I think that's we have to have those conversations anything else I think the one I just want to make uh, Meredith is that yes those emissions that are not included in geographic boundaries are bookmarked but the commitment that's been made by CPS is that they're and it's marked in the methodology section on how this will be captured that they will apply the same emissions factor across their entire grid so they are if there if there's solar panels going on in CPS energy territory to meet the, the commitments of the climate plan, they're not just going to count for those emissions that go to San Antonio, they're going to count for their entire supply. So I think that's something that's critically important is that even though those emissions are right outside the circle of being captured and counted by the plan, they are still going to be affected by the efforts that move forward with from this plan. <laughs> I'm also on the transportation um, and land use, land use group. Um, I had one question about a strategy, particularly number 12 under transportation and consumption. It's uh, sustainable land planning and development. Is there any chance of explicitly mentioning low tax, and, um, low tax, low impact development or mitigating I think you can speak to what the discussion around low impact development. But isn't it in the adaptation section as well, LID? LID is mentioned in the adaptation section. Right. It is. And yes. so, I th so I think one of the, the conversations we were having around LID is where, where does it fit in the plan? Is it a mitigation or is it an adaptation component? So you were looking at a mitigation, mitigation measure. measure. So I think um, LID was discussed in um, the adaptation side because it's more of a, a response to increased precipitation and, and flooding. So I think that's why it fit. I think we're open. We, we can, again, take another look and see if there's other places that highlight it as well. So that we need to highlight more? I think that? that is in the implementation details. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so, Sarah, so Sarah would like, Sarah from Sarah, more <laughs> evaluation of, of LID and evaluating pervious, pervious river. Okay. Yes, yeah, so we can go we'll, back to take a we'll look. We'll take a look at that. Um, and, uh, the, and I, I would also <coughs> recommend, too, if you haven't, the appendix has all of the implementation details that go along. And some of, some of the kind of right. topics fit in there where there may not be in the one sentence strategy overview. Right. 
Yeah, absolutely. Lindsay? Lindsay from UTSA, and I just have a really simple question. Um, I'm hoping that when the announcement comes out, there might also be just a simple one-page, colorful, downloadable, printable flyer that we could take to our neighborhood coffee shop or live branch library or workplace just to get more people to pay attention to this. It will be in that email. Yeah. You know, I, want, you know, I have one of the back. Too slow. Uh, I'm Diane Fuster from the steering committee. Um, I have two comments. One, um, when I was glancing through the report and came to page 13 where climate equity is discussed, I found the photo of the Blue Star Complex to be very jarring. Um, so I would definitely reconsider that. Program. Yeah, we had lots of discussions around that and, and how it's interpreted. So that's not what we're doing. Okay. And then my other comment, which I did raise at the December steering committee meeting, and I also submit it online, but I will raise again, is to promote a plant-rich diet. And I think that could easily be added on page 77 where we're looking at educating and enabling. I appreciate that. And I think the one piece around the, I, I know there's so many comments that have come in through since December, so I want to make sure, I'm not sure which who responded to which ones, but the one around the plant, um, which that we definitely will take a look in there. Um, we also expect that to be a large conversation as scope three gets reviewed because that that's really where um, food choices fit into the discussion of greenhouse gases. Other comments? I just had one, there's several places where- Your name, sir? Um, Jim Winterly with the Edward Doctor Authority and on the Water and Natural Resources Working Group. There are several places in the report where it talks about uh, expected climate impacts at the end of the century being six to 10 degrees warmer. Well, that's already two to three times more than the 1.5 degrees C that we yeah. global average that yeah. we're trying to stay under. So I think it needs to be made clear that that is an impact that is in the, if we don't implement this plan scenario and to use that to emphasize the need for this plan, perhaps I'll also provide an estimate of what we can limit it to locally if we do stick to the plan and the rest of the world is successful. Yes, I absolutely agree with you, and there's some, um, I think there could probably be a little bit more clarification of local impacts versus global changes, right? Because global warming potentially makes some places cooler too, right? Based on how those local impacts. And the other challenge that we have again and again, and I think it, potentially there's even more clarification that can be made, is that one and a half degrees, one and a half degrees Celsius, right? Which is about 2.68. Fahrenheit, which I think it's mentioned a couple times in this plan, but so it's that translation of we're using Fahrenheit for all our local impacts, the, the global is a one and a half to two degrees Celsius, which I think also helps to complicate matters for a lot of people that look at it the first time. So, yes. But uh, it just wasn't clear to me if, if that yeah. was the, we don't implement this Paris Accord uh, successfully, that's the impact then, or yeah. that's the yeah, we can we can definitely clarify that for them. And I think it's also one of those challenges too, right? If if the world implements Paris, if San Antonio implements Paris and no one else does, then we can do it. Yes. But if you can do it, everyone else can, right? And for anyone else who hasn't seen the new National Geographic, uh, has anyone seen Pittsburgh to Paris, the new documentary? Anyone watch that? The last one? Okay, if you haven't Okay, let me tell you, if you have not I highly recommend opening that up when you go home. It's about an hour long. It's called Pittsburgh to Paris. Paris it is, to Pittsburgh. Or Paris, Paris to Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh. It talks about the U.S. response to climate change and where things are happening, looking at Pittsburgh as an example. Really a great, I think, example for San Antonio to be looking at. It looks at the center of the country, what's happening in kind of red states, farmland states, the changes that are made, <coughs> being made in energy. It talks about this kind of the story of climate action and what's needed. And I think it's also a really great, really great story if you have friends, family, colleagues that are interested and want to learn a little bit more, but you know, don't want to dig into reading something, it's, it is a really good educational tool. So I will highly recommend that. 
I, I just want to chime in very quickly and say I really appreciate your comment. Something I've been very passionate about since the uh, beginning of this process has been um, educating myself and communicating to others the climate projections and impacts here locally in our community. You know, when we think about climate change, there it's a it's a big it's a big uh, there's a lot to it. It's complicated. And for me, when I look at this plan, you know, I, I know that, um, you know, looking at the two sides, mitigation and adaptation, you know, mitigation where we're, you know, our challenge uh, is in mitigation. Our opportunity is in adaptation, I think. And so, again, um, what's complicated about it is that with climate change, even though it's this global problem and we're going to have community impacts, the change has to begin with us as people, right? So in order, I think, for that to happen, we have to uh, communicate to others how it will be affecting them. And, and then that's where we can begin to think of the opportunities around adaptation or how we're going to prepare the people of San Antonio and how we're going to prepare ourselves for the change that will come. So thank you. Eloisa? I just wanted to have make one more announcement. We're kind of working on something right now, but what we did want to do is at least have one more opportunity, a public opportunity, like where um, the community can kind of come and uh, see the draft plan and actually talk to <coughs> staff and, and, and possibly talk also to um, you, you all individually. So we're trying to schedule something um, in late February. I want to say February 20th is that 19th? is the date, I think. Um, I will confirm that, and we will send an, an invite to all of you, of course, um, and ask that you possibly come, and then also talk to community members directly about the draft plan. So we did want to at least have one more um, public opportunity or meeting that is centrally located that people can talk about the plan specifically. Okay? And that will be beyond all different places. Oh, yes. Tons. Yes. Okay. Is that... Um, is that list going to be public so that they can sh how how will people find it, share and if people from the no, committees here want to share it with their add all of those events because they're all neighborhood association meetings on yep. the website. Yep. Uh, but thing the public uh, big public events or places that we will be at, um, yeah, we would definitely share those on our calendar on is it climate ready? Yeah, and some of those library oh, events yeah. as well. Yeah, because there were the team will be at the, the, right now they're scheduling libraries. And centers and such basically places that they will be for two hours you know come in talk about the plan engage with people that are there and I'm not I think sure we're going to be posting those since those are kind of uh, they're fluid and they're moving yeah I don't necessarily know for it those are going to be posted but public um, events or places that we'll be speaking absolutely yeah. yeah those we're doing canvassing we wouldn't necessarily be posting for canvassing yeah. great Peter and then so I'm Peter Bell I'm on uh, the steering committee and I wanted to say thank you to Councilman Sandoval for her question about groups, agencies represented in the room that will be taking an active role in their own spheres. I uh, appreciate that very much because I think that the fact that we're all here is testament to the fact that we're very interested in what happens, what happens next. So I would actually even ask the city if they might think in terms of, as they receive information from each of us on our scheduled events, if that could possibly be either listed as a calendar or some way made available to us so that we can leverage off of each other's uh, events and presentations. Because I think that what needs to happen, what must happen in the city is for the city to be aware and especially the business community to be aware that we are engaged and we are interested. And I know there's some, some uh, Christy Villanueva is she here today? With the West Chamber is beginning to schedule events that will incorporate chamber folks. So I would, I would make that request of the city. And all, number two, um, Doug, you talked a lot about the idea of there being ongoing conversations for iterations. Sometimes there'll be comments and you'll think in terms of there being continuing conversations. I know I'd like to be a party to those conversations and a party to those think tanks. So if you have a way that we can, if, if there's a way we can be engaged, I very much appreciate that structure. And this doesn't have to do with getting to April. April is another milestone, but it's not the end point. Okay. Yeah, we can talk some more about that. I think, you know, it's, 
as Danielle had mentioned, we've been basically writing over the holidays and editing. And so I think now that you know that one, now that we have a draft, which we recognize we're still going to have to play with, I think we'll have to figure out, particularly with 90 plus people, what's the best way of, of managing the, the communications and the coordination and you know, through April, but I think more importantly, after April as well to make sure that there's that momentum going forward. I think I think you said something that's so important and I that I agree with very much and that is the work is just going to begin in, in like May. You know, I mean, we're this is the beginning of a multi-year effort and uh, this is just a, this, a, this the beginning, right? But I will also say that every person here in this room has been um, a valuable part of this think this think, think tank and I think that we're going to end up um, I believe at the end of the day, we're going to end up with a San Antonio specific plan written by the people for the people of San Antonio. And, and so again, I think uh, that engagement with each other and with the community um, is critical to your point, because if people don't understand the plan, they can't think of solutions. And, and as Doug has mentioned, uh, great ideas um, mean nothing without their practical implementation. And so to, in order to implement, you know, we also have to inspire, right? And so I think that that's the other thing I want to, I want to uh, leave the group with is, you know, I know that this is a heavy lift and uh, obviously it's very challenging. Many of us have been working in this space for many years. And, and uh, so I'd also, I'd also say that sometimes I look at it and I'm also very encouraged, encouraged that we are coming so far encouraged by the distance that we have to go and the opportunity in front of us. And so when I talk to people about the challenges with climate change, I also want to inspire them to think about the opportunities to do things differently moving forward and what that can bring to our community. So to your point, you know, thank you to everyone here. You're all part of it. I think those are all really good points. And the one just thing I would add being kind of being able to be a little bit more of a third party and outside observer of what's the conversations that are going on in the city. You know, I get to see a lot of things in a different way in my role here. I would encourage all of you as you go out into the community to really engage with some of these people at the table and understand the communication, the conversations, and what they have been hearing from the community. Because something that's different for some of those that are on city staff is they hear comments that come back from every different side of the community where I think in a lot of cases, we hear our own little echo chamber, the people we're used to hearing, the people we know their stories. And it's hard sometimes to break out of that and understand that there may be a perspective that we haven't heard yet. So I would just highly encourage you to utilize these people to understand what some of those other conversations and stories might be that you may not have even heard because it'll help your engagement be stronger. Um, I think we have a few more comments. I, was there one over here? Yeah, we want to make sure that we allow some time for a public comment period, but I just wanted to... Yep. Okay, my name's Steve Klaus. I'm formerly with the San Antonio Water System. So we all know the fact that... Is that because of the time? Yeah. <laughs> so we all know the plan's not perfect. And if you gave us another year as a group to work on this plan, we would still have an imperfect plan. It is really the starting point, but at least we have a starting point now that we can all move forward from. And I think it's a really darn good starting point considering what we've done. When you think about a year ago when this group first started to get together, it seemed like such an insurmountable task to put something together where we could really get the input from so many different people to put together this plan. And I think that objective's been met. And the reason that objective has been met is because three people sitting at that table, Dr. Ofemi, Anita, and Doug, are the ones that really did the behind the scenes work. We all know what happened at the committee meetings, <coughs> the steering committee meeting, the technical committee meetings, but what we don't know is how much work went on behind the scenes, and I can, bet you, I can guarantee you there's a tremendous amount of work that went on to make that happen. So I just wanted to reach out to the three of those folks and say thank you for accepting that challenge and giving us this start that we can now carry forward with to the community. Thank you. I believe the gentleman in the green sweater. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, you very much. I know I can do that. And I think we have four, about four or five more hands up. Yeah. I'm going to try to run through those, and then I'm going to allow us to kind of break so that if there's some other 
Yeah. Less formal. I can questions. be really brief. I didn't. I didn't want to belabor. You know, yeah. a lot of people know kind of what my key mm -hmm. interests and talking points are. So the Actually, I have this camera on right here. Oh, so I got, camera. And, and to that point, if anybody, if you want to make sure that you memorialize or your moment <laughs> in here, speak up. But um, so I mean, Greg Harmon, steering committee. Thank you for the reminder. Um, I really want to support this plan. Um, and uh, I think the evidence of that is I've been writing about climate change in San Antonio since 2007, uh, since before any of this started. And I do want to, uh, I don't think it was a misstatement, but I want to make sure people understand that Dealey shutting down had nothing to do with the people in this room. That deal was struck by organizers and community members and volunteers dating back 8, 9, 10, 12 years. So that's where Dealey came from. Without this plan, we got four, over 4 million metric tons of greenhouse gases eliminated in San Antonio. Um, I think the challenging thing for me uh, to, to really, not that I'm going to turn on the plan, but to, to really go out full throttle and say we've got to have this, is the demonstrable short-term goals that are in line with the IPCC 1.5 degree uh, most recent plan. Uh, and I think that means that we take on spruce. And I think we shut down spruce and that's 7 million metric tons with or without the plan. Um, however, to get there, to sell it, to get San Antonio behind it, I think we need what we talked about in the very, very early stages of this was inspiration. And we continue to talk about inspiration for San Antonio. So I think ambitious goals does that. I think goals that, that, that say you know, that they're on target for getting where we need to go do that. And I do want to draw inspiration and a reminder for uh, the folks in here as we go through these rounds of edits that when the mayor and Bloomberg stood up, I was inspired that in that moment by the mayor's closing comment when he said that through this climate action plan, we have the authority to tell CPS what to do with their generation. And that's something we've skirted around for a long time in San Antonio. Council members and mayors have been unwilling to step into that. And I hope that we use and we move this plan as an opportunity, as an invitation, the mayor's invitation to tell CPS what we need from them and what we require from them to hit those goals. So thank you. That's all I'm going to say. Public citizen. I wasn't on any of the boards, but I showed up to a majority of all the meetings um, uh, to see like the different work that was going on. Um, and I kind of want to uh, draw on what uh, Russell and Greg talked about, and I know that some of the other uh, coalition members will also bring up, um, which is the like short-term reduction goals. Like uh, the page that Russell brought up earlier, page 37 was. Um, really eye-opening for me uh, because on it, it there are, are two little tables, one that says minimum acceptable reduction, which is in a, like a very linear fashion, and the other one's a high reduction potential uh, under the IPCC 1.5 uh, global pathway. But, you know, the, the minimal acceptable is the 1.5 degree pathway. There is no other minimal acceptable, like, I, I think oftentimes the language that we use cloaks the severity of what's happening um, on this planet. Two degrees is not acceptable. Two degrees is climate collapse. Many of you will not be alive in 30 years to deal with the brunt of the suffering that will happen. And this isn't anger, this is like concern and passion and the knowledge that, you know, again, it is young people, it is young people that will bear the brunt of the decisions that you are all making today, that the city is making, that CPS is making, that SAWS is making. And so when we look at like our greenway, our, our greenhouse reduction goals, 1.5 is the, is the only acceptable. There is no minimum requirement that we are not looking for a C here. We're, lo we're looking for an A plus because a C means the death and destruction. It means the unlivability of San Antonio. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to be forced to flee from my home or to die here uh, at half a life. And so I'm really calling on all of you 
yeah, this is a draft. Yeah, it's not perfect, but like this is the minimum required that we need. We need the coal plants, all of them, to be shut down by 2025, and we don't need them to be brought back as natural gas facilities. Right. We need carbon-free energy production by 2030, and we need San Antonio to be carbon neutral, to be net negative, or sorry, net uh, zero by 2040, and net uh, negative by 2050. 2050 is the big goal on here, and it's not even the one that we need. So I, I'm really asking all of you, you know, for, for your kids, for your grandkids, for, for yourselves, like, this is what's right, is to, to call into these really strict goals, <laughs> and not just on the public sector, private sector too. <sighs> yeah, I don't, I don't know what else to say. Thank you. White, also with Public Citizen. I uh, served on the Energy and Buildings uh, Technical Working Group, and uh, first of all, plus one to everything that Brianna and Greg just said. Thank you very much for those comments, and I'm really happy to have uh, Brianna as a colleague here. I'm going to focus on some of the, the same topics. CPS Energy is obviously, you know, a critical piece of reducing the emissions uh, here in San Antonio, and I think that the way that this plan obviously falls short, is in the goals that are being uh, discussed for CPS Energy. But beyond that, just the way that CPS Energy electricity sector emissions are discussed in this report I think needs to be improved. I see a number of places where those emissions are described as stationary emissions. They're described as energy emissions. There are a few places where the word electricity pops up, but it is not clear when one is scanning this report that the electricity production is a main driver of greenhouse gas emissions here in San Antonio, as it is pretty much everywhere. So I ask that throughout the report, starting on you know, page 22, 23, 24, and so on, that where it's electricity emissions from CPS Energy, that it be stated very clearly as electricity emissions from CPS Energy. Let's not pretend that it's this building putting off emissions. Right. I understand that, yes, we need efficiency, and that is important, and obviously I support that. Um, on the issue of the 3% uh, annual decrease, yes, it is just it is not in line with the Paris Agreement. And so right on page 33, I think that's just a factual inaccuracy to say in that last line that it is uh, you know, in line with the Paris Agreement. We need to be honest about what is needed or else we can't expect people to support that action. And, you know, one of the, the things that we spent a lot of time on in, definitely in the Energy and Buildings Working Group, was that discussion of the appropriate pathway and the methodology, and we spent a bunch of time talking about the C40 deadline 2020 methodology and those you know, those, those charts that are distinctly not a straight line reduction, they are kind of more of a falling off a cliff graph. I don't see that graph uh, in here, and I have not got all the way to the end, so maybe it's somewhere back in the methodology, but I think that it, you know, it needs to be where we're talking about these different pathways. And I think the same thing goes for the, the deadline 2020 uh, methodology. That should, that should be in here front and center because it, it was definitely a big part of our, uh, our conversation. I'm really appreciative of everybody who contributed to making this uh, plan you know, move forward as it has, I do think there's a lot of room for improvement, and I hope that everybody will jump in and, and push for those improvements. Thanks. I have one more comment here. Hey, everybody. I'm Beto Davila Del Gon. I was on the Water and Natural Resources Working Group. Um, and I guess it's kind of a question and then a comment. My first question is when can we expect resources and the appendices in Spanish so that we can work with our members um, at Southwest Workers Union, Centro por la Justicia. And then I guess um, one thing that I was kind of thinking and, and reflecting on when we were getting ready um, for our last meeting in, in November um, was just that 
I, I think I might have mentioned this, but I want to bring it up again because yes, we're always excited to meet up with our members and talk about things that are going on and work on different pieces to make policy more understandable to everyone. Um, but I'm kind of hoping that we can expect the same from city council officials is just as much as they put in energy into um, trying to defeat propositions A, B, and C. We got flyers and TV ads and radio ads and you know, there was this urgency that we had to go out and, and protect these pieces and, and protect the city manager. But you know, our livelihoods are just, there should be an urgency for our livelihoods and the sustainability of our community. Um, so I really hope that the city and CPS, who we heard so much about the flex plan, I wanna see those same types of promotion pushing the advancement of this plan because we can all say that we support it, but the actions are gonna back it up. Um, and I would like to also see more involvement from SAW is also saying that this is something that they wanna get behind and seeing more investment from them in, in sustainability um, around this piece that we're trying to push. So it's kind of like two, it's twofold. Like we can do some on the ground and we're going to, and we've been doing that um, in all of our orgs and all of our spaces, but it's, it's kind of double-sided. Like we can't keep asking the communities that are most affected to keep carrying the brunt of the work on our backs too. Can you respond to the yeah. question on the Spanish version? We are sending that to, um, to, get, get, to make sure that we can get that translated. I saw one other hand. I'm gonna one final comment here, and then I'm. We're not leaving this room, but I'm going to close down this kind of open forum, and we're gonna allow. We're gonna all be circulating around. If other questions, want to bring comments to the table, want to discuss with your neighbors. Uh, we're happy to um, to have that. Hi, I'm Larry Graff. I'm chair of the U.S. Green Building Council, uh, South Texas region. Uh, we go from New Braunfels all the way down to the border. But I've talked to our national organization, and our national group has developed uh, net zero energy plans, net zero carbon plans, net zero water plans, and net zero waste plans. And um, I've talked with them, and uh, like the Bloomberg, uh, they are willing to send subject matter experts uh, to, to meet with us uh, to help finish off this plan and help to develop an implementation plan. So uh, thank you. Uh, and we will have uh, uh, several uh, presentations on the calendar. Great, thank you. I'll let you uh, say something. Okay. Thanks. Well, <laughs> I thought I, you were gonna say something. Yeah, I, I mean, something. I'll, I'll say something briefly that, um, you know, We've, we've all known um, over the course of this last year that this has been really a historic plan for San Antonio, a historic beginning. Um, I appreciate all of the comments that I've heard throughout the process, and especially a lot of the comments that we've heard here this afternoon. And uh, I, I think about them a lot, and I'm sure uh, a lot of us do because, you know, we've, we've talked about this. It is not a small thing, as many of our, our uh, colleagues or friends have pointed out it's not a small thing to um, you know have uh, such an impact on so many people's lives you know and generations to come the future of San Antonio and it will take at the end of the day uh, in some form or fashion our community will continue to transition over the course of time right and um, you know in, in working together has been such a great uh, opportunity for all of us and I've learned so much from so many of you and have gotten to know so many of you and I've learned so much from all of you. So I, I wanna just say thank you very much for this. Um, thank you, Doug and Danielle. Nils, Nils Frankel, he's in the back. They're from Navigant. Thank you, Nils. And Femi, it's been an honor to work with you. And um, this is the beginning and, it, and, and the, the heavy lift is not over you know, this is going to be playing out for years to come in terms of implementation and, and all the all the laundry list things. But, you know, again, we have to have a plan that fits everyone. Um, and that is uh, uh, very challenging and very exciting and a historic thing for San Antonio. So thank you so much for letting me be a part of this. I consider this one of truly the most important things I've done in, in my life. So thank you very much. For, it's been an honor to help serve San Antonio. So. And then I'll just sum up. A big shout out to the Climate Equity Group. 
Yeah. You guys got you. dealt. You guys got dealt a very difficult task. Um, as you read through it, send us your comments from the mundane. You spelled my name wrong. To your more substantial comments, um, and then really, this is about getting the word out. I, yes. I think um, you know, if there's if we're not being aggressive enough in the plan, the more people that we hear from, the more people who are brought up to speed as far as why we're doing this and what the options are, um, that'll help move the city um, further and faster. So I think helping us with that awareness and, and engagement around the plan will be critical. Uh, but just you know, final words, uh, Councilman Sandoval, and thank really you. thank you for all your leadership on this. Um, you've been pivotal to this. And, um, And um, we, you know, we look forward to working with you on really making this plan a reality. You know, it's, it's one thing having it done, but we have to actually take action. So thank you. And thank you all for your continued um, work and support. Thank you. Thanks.